No, Genesis chapter 38. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. There, Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and made love to her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son who was named Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. She gave birth to still another son and named him Shelah. It was at Kizib that she gave birth to him. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Sleep with your brother's wife, and fulfil your duty to her as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the child would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to avoid providing offspring for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death also. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Live as a widow in your father's household until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, he may die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's household. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah, to the men who were shearing his sheep, and his friend Hera the Adullamite went with him. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and then sat down at the entrance to Enem, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that, though Sheila had now grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. Not realising that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, Come now, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with you? she asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock, he said. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it? she asked. He said, what pledge should I give you? Your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her and slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. After she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. Meanwhile, Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adullamite, in order to get his pledge back from the woman, but he did not find her. He asked the men who lived there, where is the shrine prostitute who is beside the road at Enaim? There hasn't been any shrine prostitute there here, they said. So he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her. Besides, the men who lived there said, there hasn't been any shrine prostitute here. Then Judah said, oh, let her keep what she has, or we will become a laughing stock. After all, I did send her this young goat, but you didn't find her. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she's now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and let her be burnt to death. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her my son, Sheila. And he did not sleep with her again. And when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand, so the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it to his wrist and said, this one came out first. But when he drew back his hand, his brother came out and she said, so this is how you have broken out. And he was named Perez. 
Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread on his wrist, came out, and he was named Zerah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Quite a reading, isn't it? And uh, if you're a visitor here or here for the first time, just let me say we don't have readings like this normally in church on a Sunday. (laughs) Uh, But we do need to pray, so let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. Thank you that uh, you have events like this which remind us what life is like in this world, pretty broken at times. But thank you that you're involved and we see you at work here in this chapter. And now we pray that your word and your spirit will change our lives just as you uh, were at work in these people's lives. Have mercy on us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you notice how the uh, chapter started, uh, verse 1 there? At that time. So what time uh, was that? Well, in the previous chapter, Joseph had been sold by his brothers to uh, some merchants. These merchants had then sold him on to a military family uh, in Egypt. So chapter 38 begins with that kind of background. But in verse 1 here, Judah, one of the brothers, uh, brothers of 12, uh, is leaving them. He's going to live in Adullam, uh, which is southwest of Jerusalem. So this was a a serious moment for the family that God had chosen. Remember, God had chosen this family to be his people, uh, to be his servants uh, in this world. And the family's beginning to split up. Uh, Chapter 38 Uh, is really the launch of the tribe of Judah. Uh, And what a crazy launch it was. Uh, I mean, I come from Merseyside, and I went to quite a few launches uh, over the years. And normally, uh, it was champagne that spilt. uh, But here, it's semen uh, that goes on the floor. Yet the tribe of Judah is going to turn out uh, to be uh, the most famous tribe uh, of the 12 uh, in Israel. And it has a fascinating start. So all the great kings of Judah, David, Solomon, uh, the great kings of Judah are up there, if you've never noticed. I only was told that at the 9.30 service. But the bottom half of that stained glass window has the kings of Judah on it. Uh, And there's some very famous uh, men. When uh, Israel divided, uh, it really ended up Judah versus the rest. And then... Remember, our Lord was born into the tribe of Judah. Uh, And he's called in heaven the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So it's a very famous uh, tribe, but a very unusual start to any kind of tribe. Uh, We, we of course, see that Judah's family also uh, was very unusual. Uh, Their sex life was unusual. Uh, Their relationships with each other were unusual. Yes, chapter 38 is a very quirky chapter. Uh, It's a sad chapter. It has all the ingredients of a good story for the Sunday papers. Sex, deceit, uh, prostitute, sudden death. And yet, as I've spent time with this dysfunctional family, it has increased, believe it or not, my love and my confidence in God. Because God is here working in all the muck of life. And my prayer is that it's going to be the same for all of us, uh, that God will increase our confidence in who God is, what he's doing uh, in this world, and how he can change uh, people's lives. Now, many of us come from dysfunctional families. I should think most of us come from dysfunctional families. I certainly do. Uh, And we have all these kinds of qualities, deceit, betrayal. Uh, We even have one of our church families getting, uh, sorry, not our church family, my own personal family, uh, getting involved with prostitutes. So we've got the whole show. Uh, And with these things comes a lot of pain uh, and a lot of hurt and a lot of sorrow. We we can't see that uh, in this chapter, but there is a lot of suffering. But the good news is, in chapter 38, that God is at work in all the chaos and all the rottenness. But of course, the rot is not just out there. The rot is in here. It's in here, in this building. We're all struggling, broken uh, people. 
uh, and there's quite a lot of rot in most of our hearts. But all through the Bible, there are stories like this where God works with this kind of family and with this kind of people, just as he does here with the family of Judah. So I want to look at two ways in which God works in this family. We see the judgment of God, and we see also the sovereign grace of God. We'll start with the judgment, become, because that comes first. The Lord's judgment on his people. Now, the Lord is only mentioned four times in the chapter. <clears throat> and on each time, it has to do with the judgment of these two brothers. Verse 7. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. We're not told there what the wickedness was uh, in Ur's life. We only know that he was wicked in the Lord's sight. And ultimately, that's all that matters, isn't it? It's never our job to judge other people. It's none of our business. And have you noticed also in this chapter that there is no moral judgment by the writer. He doesn't pass judgment on anyone. He just tells us the story. It's so different to the world we live in. I mean, in the media, we have lots of moral uh, finger-wagging and finger-pointing, don't we, at people who've messed up their lives. It doesn't happen in this chapter. We only know that Ur was wicked in the Lord's sight. The Lord is mentioned again in verse 10, what Onan did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death also. We are told what Onan had done. Uh, look at verses 8 and 9. These are the verses uh, that describe what was a custom right around the Middle East. This isn't just something that happened among the Jews. Uh, it's known as leveret marriage. L-E-V-I-R-A-T-E. -E. Uh, a leveret marriage was built on the, the assumption that the family would look after the widow, the recently deceased widow, because there were no social services. And so it was a, an act of kindness uh, to the, the widowed wife. In practice, leveret marriage meant that the nearest relative uh, married the widow so that they could have children in the same line as the man who died. Now, this must have been a fantastic support to widows. Uh, it didn't work here in chapter 38, but if you read the book of Luke, it worked brilliantly. Uh, and it was for the benefit of the widow. So in verse 8, Judah told Onan, his second son, to sleep uh, with Tamar and to continue the family line. Uh, that's what Onan did. But in verse 9, look what happened. But Onan knew that the child would be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground. So Onan had sex, but no children for Tamar or his brother. And that's why Onan died. We're told here it was wicked in the Lord's sight. Now, you may think this is very severe, but remember, this is God's new society. This is God's new people, a holy people that are there to serve him and his purposes in, in the world. And of course, we have to remember who God is. Hebrews 12, 28 tells us, worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And if God is a consuming fire, he needs respect. Uh, fire is powerful. Fire is dangerous. And through the Old Testament, God brings judgment on his own people in many and various ways. I've been really surprised this week at how often God does judge his people. But Isaiah calls God's judgment on his own people, his strange work, God's alien work. Hosea even tells us how the Lord feels when he carries out this judgment. In Hosea 11, we see there is turmoil in God's heart when he thinks that he's got to judge his people. 
Within me, we read, all my compassion is aroused. God's judgment hurts the heart of God on his own people. Of course, God's judgment happened in the New Testament. Some people try to make a difference between the God of the New Testament and the God of the New Testament, but it happens again. What about Ananias and Sapphira in the early church? They came under God's judgment and died. As Christians, we're warned about judgment. What about 1 Corinthians 11? There, it's the Holy Communion service that Paul is writing about. And he says this in verse 27, Who eats, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning. And so Paul tells us to examine our lives. That's why we always need to have a, co a confession in the communion so we can confess our sins. It's a holy meal. What happens if we don't examine our lives? Well, Paul gives us the answer. In verse 30, he says, This is why many among you are weak and ill, and a number of you have fallen asleep. So the judgment of God is very serious. It, it's not easy to preach about it. But it's there in the Bible. As his people, God does deal with us. And we see there that God's judgment can bring weakness, illness, and even death. Now, when I was very ill, I was, I was about 21 years ago, I was really ill, and I remember one of the first things I thought is, am I under the judgment of God? Because that's what you think when you're ill. As far as I know, I wasn't. But God does bring judgment on us, his people. But actually, Paul then says something that is very helpful for us in verse 32. He says, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. See, that's good for us. That's very good news, actually. So the Lord's judgment for the Christian is not damnation. It's discipline so that on the final day, our eternal security is secure. See what Paul is saying? But we are disciplined. And so God disciplines us now, so we will not be lost eternally. You see, remember when we come to Jesus as our saviour? Most of us can look back and see that was a time when that happened. God becomes our father. And as fathers, when we see our children messing up, our initial response may be we want to kill them. But actually that wears off after a while. And we really want to help them. Because that's what fathers are supposed to do. And that's what our God as our father is doing. He's disciplining us. He's wanting to help us. So our Heavenly Father does not want to kill us. He wants us to get to heaven and to be with him. This is what God says in Romans 5.20. Where sin increased, grace increased the more. That's for us, his people. We've experienced the grace of God. When sin increases in our life, the grace of God, the love of God is at work because he wants to get us into heaven. He wants to save us eternally. See what we're being told. The Lord is on our side against sin. The Lord hates sin, but the Lord loves us. And this is the biblical storyline uh, that really has taken my breath away this week. See what we're being told. When we come to the Lord, it's our sin that opens the heart of God. It's not because how good we are, or how lovely we are, or how holy we are. No, actually, our sin opens his heart. Because where sin increased, grace increased more. This is the God we believe in. 
a God of great grace. It's rather when he sees our unloveliness, God's love goes out to us and he wants to change us and rescue us and make us his holy people. It's rather very good news, isn't it? Even in judgment, we see the grace of God uh, at work in our lives. And this is what makes God's grace overflow. What a tragedy if verse 10 had been the final sentence chapter 30, of chapter 38. So the Lord put Onan to death. But it isn't the last sentence. God himself was put to death. 1,800 years later, when God came and gave his only son, he took our judgment. He, put him, he allowed himself to die on the cross so that we can be saved. Edmund Clowney put it like this. Jesus came not to destroy people, but to save them. His hands did not grasp a sword, but were stretched out to be pierced with nails. He did not lift a spear, but received the thrust of the spear in his side. He did not come to bring judgment, but to bear it for us. So yes, we do believe in a God of judgment. I'm very pleased we do believe in a God of judgment, because the evil in this world and the wickedness that there is has to be dealt with. And God has promised he's going to deal with it. But amazingly, he has taken the judgment for those who come to the saviour of the world and trust him so that we can go to heaven. So that's the first thing. The God of judgment carried out on the people of God. But then the second thing we're going to notice is the Lord's sovereign grace. We're now going to focus mainly on Judah uh, because Judah is such uh, rotten raw material uh, for the Lord to use. He's just like the rest of us. Uh, we've all got this rot in our hearts. Uh, Judah certainly looks to be on the downward spiral. Look at verse 1. Uh, Judah left his brothers. This meant that uh, Judah left God's people. Uh, and he immersed himself in Canaanite culture. You can see that all in verses 1 to 11 of chapter 38. What I've noticed over the years is when people leave God's people or the church, they tend to leave God as well. And that's what we're going to see happens uh, in this chapter. So verse 1, Judah lived with a Canaanite man. Verse 2, uh, he married a Canaanite woman. Verse 11, uh, Judah treats his Canaanite daughter-in-law very poorly. And then notice how superstitious Judah has become, Judah has become, in verse 11. He blamed Tamar for the death of his two sons. How ridiculous. It's his two sons who are the problem, uh, not his daughter-in-law. We then see how far Judah had moved away from the Lord. Uh, look at his time with the prostitute in verses 13 to 23. This is the largest section of the chapter. Uh, Tamar was a very sharp operator. She sets up the perfect sting to, cap, uh, to trap Judah. So Tamar must have understood, though, what kind of a man Judah was. That if he saw a prostitute on the side of the road, he would pull over and pick her up which is exactly what happened. Look at verse 16. He went over to her by the roadside and said, come now, let me sleep with you. Now we've already been told that it was sheep shearing time. So it was party time, harvest time was fun time. Sex was on the agenda. Sex was on the agenda because the Canaanites worshipped fertility gods. The thinking of that culture was that you could uh, encourage the gods to be fertile in the country by having uh, ritual, ritual sex. And this is why in verse 21, Tamar set herself up 
uh, as a shrine prostitute because that's how things worked. So Judah, who was about to shear his sheep, if he had a bit of ritual sex, his sheep would produce more sheep because the gods would be pleased. But see what it tells us about Judah. Judah had not only left God's people, he'd also left God, the creator, the maker, the one who's ultimately in charge. And he'd now got caught up in Canaanite religion. In the past, we would have called someone like Judah a backslider, which is a very good description of how people move away from God. I've never known anyone uh, who's woken up one morning and said, I'm finished with God, that's it. I'm going to ditch Christianity uh, and live my own life. Generally, people slide away from God. They drift away from God. That was Judah. Now, there may not be any moral judgment by the writer of this chapter, but Judah doesn't let us down. When Judah hears that Tamar is pregnant in verse 24, he has a sort of moral rage. You've heard about road rage. Well, this is moral rage. Look at what Judah says in verse 24. Bring her out and let her be burned to death. Judah the villain, yet he has the cheek uh, to say this. But as we all know, it doesn't finish here. Uh, Tame is far too smart. Verse 25, as she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I'm pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognise whose seal and cord and staff these are. Game, set and match to Tamar. But something even more amazing was happening. God was using Tamar to save the line of Judah. Tamar the outsider, Tamar the Canaanite, Tamar the fake prostitute comes in and saves the line of Judah. By verse 27, uh, Tamar's carrying twins. And we're given quite a lot of detail about the birth. Why? So we can be sure that Perez is the firstborn, because you can see there's a bit of a struggle there in those verses. Why is that so important? Well, 1,800 years later, Perez appears again in the New Testament, in Jesus' genealogy, Matthew chapter 1, verse 2. We read this. Jacob, the father of Judah, Judah, the father of Perez, whose mother was Tamar. Brilliant, isn't it? This sordid, sad little story of Genesis 38 is there in the genealogy of our Lord. This is the sovereign grace of God. Tamar, the outsider in the genealogy of Jesus. Perez an ancestor of the saviour of the world. I love the sovereign grace of God, but probably my favourite doctrine, because it reminds us God is in charge and God is full of grace. See also how sovereign grace was at work in the life of Judah. Verse 26, Judah recognised the seal and the cord and the staff and said, she's more righteous than I since I wouldn't give her to my son, Shelah. For the first time, we begin to see a change in Judah. He accepts he's guilty. He no longer blames Tamar. And this happens all through the Bible. When people begin to realise that they've got a problem in their hearts, when they're sinners, when they need to sort something out, God begins to work. And this has to be the greatest miracle in life. I think this is far greater than any healing miracle when God can begin to change our hearts and begin to change our souls and begin to sanctify us and make us holy and his people. We don't meet Judah again until chapter 44. Judah and the ten brothers are on their way home 
from Egypt with more food for the family. But they're overtaken uh, by the servants of Joseph and are taken back to face Joseph. Because what's happened is a Joseph, one of Joseph's silver cups was found in Benjamin's sack. And Joseph has threatened to make Benjamin his slave for life. But amazingly, as the brothers are standing there in front of Joseph, saying what's going to happen, Judah steps forward. And Judah pleaded on behalf of his old father. And he offers to be the substitute for Benjamin and to become the slave so that Benjamin can go home. What a transformation. But this is the power of God's sovereign grace. He changes people in a wonderful and amazing way. Many of us have put our hands up and say, God has changed me. I'm amazed the way God has changed my life and he's changed your life. This is what God does. And notice here that grace is making Judah a bit like his most famous descendant, Jesus. Because this morning, Jesus intercedes for us. We're told he's in heaven, interceding on our behalf. That's great news. And also, our Lord substituted himself for us on the cross. He took our place and carried our sin and took our judgment. And for Judah, all this change began when he realised he was guilty. Now, there may be someone here this morning, maybe someone listening online, and you'll be, you've been coming aware of your sin in your own life. This is what can change us all. It doesn't matter how long we've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how long we've been in the church. Judah was born into the people of God. Well, this could be the day, like Judah, when we begin life again with God and we turn to God and we allow him to change us. There's a, a song Christians uh, used to sing. I haven't heard it sung for years. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is open and you may come in. At Calvary's cross is where we begin when we come as a sinner to Jesus. Just the same, just the same as going on here uh, in this chapter of Genesis. Shall we pray? Father, I want to thank you this morning that this tragic story is in your word. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us who you are and what you do among us as your people. We understand that you are a God of judgment and you do bring discipline in our lives. But we praise you and we thank you that you took our judgment on the cross in your Son. And we thank you that this morning the cross, the door is open for all of us to come back to you. And just like Judah, we know we're guilty. But we thank you, you've given us a great saviour. And we thank you that we can put our trust in him. And although our sin is great, your grace increases all the more. And we praise you and thank you that that is the story of the Bible. It's the story of this chapter. And we praise you for your grace. And we bow before you this morning as our saviour. And we trust you and we love you and we thank you that you are sovereign and that you're gracious. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.